Welcome back everyone to another video on complex variables. In this lesson I'm going to teach you how to use the residue theorem to evaluate definite integrals. In particular I'm going to look at definite integrals involving sines and cosines. In the next video I'll move to improper integrals. So let's begin. In this lecture I'm going to examine a particular class of integrals of this form where I'm integrating a function of cosine theta and sine theta from 0 to 2 pi. Now because this integration involves the variable theta varying from 0 to 2 pi, you might immediately think of polar coordinates and circles when you look at an integral like this. You might remember from polar coordinates that theta is used to represent the angle relative to the positive x-axis. And you might also remember that theta varies from 0 to 2 pi. So in varying theta from 0 to 2 pi for a constant radius, we're essentially going around a circle. In fact, you could say that this integral essentially involves integrating the function capital F along a unit circle, with theta representing the angle in radians from the positive x-axis, which varies from 0 to 2 pi. We can actually take advantage of this similarity and make a change of variables. We can use the polar representation of complex numbers to let our complex number z equal the exponential of i times theta. Then we can make the relevant substitutions from theta to z. We can replace the differential of theta by the differential of z by taking the derivative of equation 1 with respect to theta. In that case, the dz d theta is just i times the exponential of i theta, which can be rewritten as i times z just by plugging in the z from equation 1. So just switch around the differentials and we'll find that d theta is just dz over iz. Now all that's left is to switch the cosine theta and sine theta to functions of z. And that's actually pretty easy. We're going to use Euler's formula to expand equation 1 in terms of sines and cosines. We can also write another equation involving 1 over z, which would just be the exponential of negative i times theta. Expanding this out using Euler's formula will yield cosine theta minus i sine theta. I'll just call this equation 3. Now let's add equations 2 and 3 and get an expression for cosine theta in terms of z. We can also subtract 2 and 3 to get an expression for sine theta in terms of z. So if we plug all these expressions into our integral up here, then we'll end up with the contour integral over c of the function capital F, now all in terms of z, times dz over iz. Note that the c here, the curve you're integrating over, is the unit circle centered at the origin. Now once you convert your integral in terms of theta into an integral in terms of z, you can then use the residue theorem to evaluate the integral. So let's do an example involving finding a definite integral that contains sine and cosine. In this example, we want to integrate 1 over 5 plus 4 sine theta from 0 to 2 pi. This is where you'll see why the residue theorem is so useful. Because if I were to ask you to integrate this using the regular techniques you learned in Calculus 2, then you wouldn't be able to do anything here. Regular substitution won't work, partial fractions won't work, and integration by parts won't work. You'll have to use a technique called the Weierstrass substitution which isn't even covered in most Calculus 2 courses. It's a rather exotic technique. But using the residue theorem, however, does allow you to solve this integral in a manner that you might argue is even more convenient than the Weierstrass substitution. So let's get started. Notice that this integral follows the form up here, so we can immediately move to substituting z in place of theta and converting this into a contour integral over the unit circle. If we do that, then our integral becomes the contour integral over the unit circle c of 1 over 5 plus 4 times z minus z inverse over 2i, which is just sine theta as we showed earlier, times dz over iz, which is just the differential d theta re-expressed in terms of dz as we showed earlier as well. We can then simplify this integral and get the following expression. What we want to do now is use the residue theorem to evaluate this integral. But before we use the residue theorem, let's take the time to recall the exact statement. 
The exact statement here is that if f of z is some complex function with a bunch of singular points or poles, then the contour integral of f of z over a simple closed curve c, which encloses all these poles, is just 2 pi i times the sum of the residues of f of z at each of the enclosed singular points. Now how is the residue theorem going to help us for this example? Well, here we're integrating this function that I'll conveniently label f of z over a unit circle, which is our simple closed contour c. So if I need to evaluate this integral, I can find the singular points of f of z, find their corresponding residues, add them together, and use the result to determine the value of the integral via the residue theorem. So let's start applying the residue theorem by first finding the singular points of our function. The singular points here would be the values of z at which the function is undefined, which cause the denominator to be zero. To find those singular points, I can use the quadratic formula to find the zeros of the denominator. If I do that, then I'll get two distinct values of z which make the denominator zero. The first is going to be negative 0.5i if I use the plus sign in the quadratic formula. And the second is negative 2i if I use the minus sign in the quadratic formula. Now this first root clearly has a magnitude less than 1, so it's going to be inside our unit circle. However, the second root has a magnitude greater than 1, so it's going to be outside our unit circle. We're only concerned about the residues for the poles inside the contour of integration, so we only need to find the residue at z1. Now, let's rewrite this integral in factored form, since we've already found the zeros of the denominator. And let's now find the residue at z1. Since z minus z1, or z plus 0.5i, only appears in the denominator once, it clearly corresponds to a simple pole. If you remember the previous lecture, then we can find the residues at simple poles by multiplying f of z by z minus z1, and taking the limit as z approaches z1. And if you compute the limit, you'll find that the residue is just 1 over 3i. And this is the only residue we're concerned with. If we now apply the residue theorem, we'll find that the integral over c of dz over 2 times z plus 2i times z plus 0.5i equals 2 pi i times 1 over 3i, which equals 2 pi over 3. So therefore, we can conclude that the integral from 0 to 2 pi of 1 over 5 plus 4 sine theta is just 2 pi over 3. And that does it for this example. Pretty simple stuff, no ridiculous wire stress substitution necessary. Let's now do another example. Here we're going to find the integral from 0 to pi of sine theta raised to the power 2n, where n is some positive integer. The issue here is that this integral is from 0 to pi, but from what we've learned so far, we want our integrals to be between 0 and 2 pi. But going around this issue isn't too difficult once you recognize that sine theta raised to the power 2n is the same from pi to 2 pi as it is from 0 to pi. Go ahead, plot the graph for a bunch of n's and you'll see that this is correct. This fact is actually pretty convenient because we can exploit the symmetricity to say that the integral from 0 to pi is just half the integral from 0 to 2 pi. Since the function being integrated repeats itself once we reach theta equals pi. So now that the integral is in the proper form, meaning from 0 to 2 pi, we can use the substitutions to convert theta to z and express our integral purely in terms of z. When we convert everything to z, this is what we'll end up with. Note that c is again just the unit circle centered at the origin. This looks like a pretty complicated expression, but we can simplify it. Take out the 2i so you end up with 2i to the power 2n. Now the 2 to the power 2n can just be written as 4 to the n, while the i to the power 2n can be written as negative 1 to the power n. Let's take out all the constants from the integral and leave only the terms involving z. Now the z minus z inverse to the 2n term seems pretty difficult to manage, but we can deal with it using the binomial theorem. The reason we want to use the binomial theorem is that using the binomial theorem will ultimately give us an expansion of this expression, which we can use to find the residue of this integrand, which we'll use to apply the residue theorem.
So let's recall the binomial theorem, which states that a plus b to the power m is the sum from r equals zero to m of a to the m minus r times b to the r times m choose r. So if we apply the binomial theorem to the numerator of our integrand, to the numerator of the function we're integrating, we'll find that the k plus one term of this expansion is z to the two n minus k times negative one to the k times z inverse to the power k times two n choose k. Let's simplify this by combining the terms involving z and we'll get the following. And now let's substitute this into the integral but now we'll have a summation out front because a bunch of these terms have to be added together to give the binomial expansion of z minus z inverse to the power two n. Now what we want here is the term corresponding to the residue term in the Laurent expansion of the integral. Since we're already dividing by z in the expression for the integral, all we have to do here is find the term in the binomial expansion for the numerator, which is a constant, because a constant divided by z will just be the residue term. We can see that the constant term in this binomial expansion will be the term where k equals n. So the coefficient of the term with k equals n is then the residue of the integrand around the pole at z equals zero, which happens to be the only pole we're dealing with here. That means the residue of this integrand is just negative one to the n times two n factorial over n factorial squared. And this also happens to be the only residue since there's only one pole inside the curve c, and that's z equals zero. So now if we apply the residue theorem to compute this whole integral, this is what we'll get. And if we simplify this expression, we'll finally end up with 2n factorial over 2 to the power 2n times n factorial squared times pi. So we found the integral of sine of theta to the power 2n using the residue theorem. And that should do it for this video. If you enjoyed the lesson, feel free to like and subscribe. In the next complex variables video, I'm going to be using the residue theorem to compute improper integrals. Thank you for watching and this is the faculty of Khan signing out.